Nowhere is Sir Gangaram more celebrated than Lahore. Once upon a time, you know, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, Jains, they lived side by side. I have nothing left to give. I've given it all away to charity or to my family, but I still have my house, so you can have that. I've met so many Lahores and Punjabis who strive every day to achieve the greatness of some of the founders and architects of the city of Lahore. For me and my husband, um, what was kind of the climactic moment in our, in our trip thus far. Hello and welcome to Infer Talks, a podcast where we put you in the room with some of the biggest thought leaders from around the world. Our guest today uh, has a very special relationship with Lahore. Uh, she's the great-great-granddaughter of Sir Ganga Ram, who is also known as the father of modern Lahore. Um, and we have the privilege of having her with us today. Um, and uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce to you Senator Keisha Ram Hinsdale. Thank you so much for joining us today, Senator. Thank you for having me. Uh, so how has it been? Um, how, how long have you been in Pakistan for and uh, what brings you here? So our trip has lasted only a little more than a week, mm -hmm. but every day has uh, brought a lifetime of memories and uh, a wealth of new experiences that have been unparalleled so far in my life uh, to know how well preserved and celebrated the legacy of Sir Ganga Ram has been for a century here in Lahore has meant more to me than people can know. Mm -hmm. And have you always had a relationship with the memory of Sir Ganga Ram uh, growing up? In fact, I haven't. Um, oh. We've been exploring this a lot over the course of the trip, but as I think many people of Lahore can appreciate, the partition of 1947 created a lot of pain and loss on both sides of that newly formed border. And my father's generation who left, he actually was in my grandmother's womb when they left. Mm -hmm. My aunt was uh, a toddler. That generation really doesn't like to talk about what was left behind. Mm -hmm. um, it's painful and it's understandable, but that means that it took me until college to really understand the impact that Sir Gangaram had. Uh, it was believed by my father's generation that the legacy and name of Sir Gangaram would be wiped away in mm -hmm. Lahore. And that's why in 1953, they recreated Sir Gangaram Hospital in Delhi. Right. Uh, that certainly I knew was part of my legacy, but I have to say, Nowhere is Sir Gangaram more celebrated than Lahore. Um, the the Lahori people keep up their knowledge of his legacy mm -hmm. in a far greater way. And so it took me until meeting a professor from Lahore who essentially said to me, I don't think you realize that we say a prayer to your great great grandfather every day. And mm -hmm. imagine hearing that, <laughs> you know, after you've spent a majority of your young adult life thinking you had no connection to a place because of all this uh, resettlement and displacement. So how how has your experience been uh, visiting Lahore? And if I'm not mistaken, you've also been to a couple of uh, very important sites that your grandfather was instrumental in uh, designing. Uh, so how has that experience been for you? Well, it certainly feels like a homecoming. Mm -hmm. And the people of Lahore and Punjab have made sure I feel incredibly welcome here. Uh, we have not only seen some of Sir Gangaram's great public works right here in Lahore, in the center of the city, with the High Court, the Post Office, the Lahore Museum, the National College of the Arts, the old building at Aitchison College. Everyone could go on and on. Yeah. But we even left uh, Lahore to Ranala and the power station there that he built over 100 years ago mm -hmm. that, in fact, still produces power for 27 villages in the area. And that has been really special for us because we, I represent in the state Senate, I represent a rural state. Vermont is one of the most rural states in the country. And so often rural places are forgotten. Mm -hmm. If you want prosperity or opportunity, you have to go to the city. You have to break apart your family. Uh, I believe because Sir Gangaram 
came from a smaller village and came from a humble background, he never forgot who he was. And he believed that modernity shouldn't be only available to the select few. Right. That he should be able to travel back to rural places and make sure they have power and light and good, healthy food. Uh, and he made that possible with a, a pure feat of ingenuity in his power station. And if I'm not mistaken, that, that power station uh, is designed to produce renewable energy. The power station he built mm -hmm. is, the, to my knowledge, the first hydropower station in the subcontinent. And even more impressive, many power stations relying on hydroelectricity around the world cause a lot of disruption and damage to local communities. They flood villages. Mm -hmm. They disrupt the flow of water and kill a lot of species in the river. He created a power plant that can power thousands of homes with just a 10-foot drop in the water uh, in a way that doesn't disrupt its flow mm -hmm. further down the river. And he never had to displace people. Mm -hmm. You look at one side of the river and the other, and you feel like you're you wouldn't have seen a power plant that's giving thousands of people access to electricity. Mm -hmm. When you go inside, one of the most impressive things, and I think the thing that would mean the most to Sir Ganga Ram, is that it's been kept up so incredibly well. Mm -hmm. He designed a power plant that would last for 25 years, and he only could have hoped that it would keep producing power longer than that. Right. So it produces power 100 years later. And when we went to visit... Of course, we met wonderful philanthropists and ministers, local ministers for the area. But I kept saying, I'd really like to meet the people who've kept the power plant running for this long. And mm -hmm. so finally, they pushed forward the technical supervisor there. And right. we've come to find out he's worked there for 30 years. Oh, his wow. father worked there before him and his grandson works there as well. So if anyone is responsible for keeping this power plant going, it's likely his family because they don't make these kinds of parts anymore. If something breaks, they have to know how to fix it themselves. Yeah. And I know Sir Gungaram, more importantly than the buildings he created, cared about the people who would earn a living, the people who would benefit from what was generated. And so it meant a lot to me, probably before this man retires, to just offer him my blessing and mm. my thanks for keeping Sir Gungaram's marvel alive in this way. That's actually that's actually wonderful. Um, and... That does make sense as well, like you mentioned. Um, you know, there, there, there's a certain sense of community when it comes to rural societies, um, and uh, for for um, a structure for an installation that is, uh, you know, supporting uh, the energy needs of so many people, um, it makes sense that it's been passed down through the generations uh, and 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 being maintained with such, uh, you know, with 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 such love and with such attention. Um, it really, it speaks to everything I've experienced mm -hmm. in, in Punjab and particularly Lahore. We visited his final residence. Mm -hmm. In fact, the place that he built but never got to live because he passed away right as it was being finished. But the place that, in fact, my grandparents lived themselves. And it's still owned by a Kenyan member of parliament, uh, whose family has been here a long time. His father, in fact, was a doctor right. at Sir Gungaram Hospital and didn't want to see the building fall into disrepair. So all of these marvels have been kept up in such a way without anyone knowing that one of his descendants may return, but so that a great-great-granddaughter could come 100 years later and still experience the splendor and grandeur that he tried to create mm -hmm. a century ago. I can only imagine uh, what you must have felt, you know, like uh, seeing all of this and, and, and also all the different stories that come with these different places, right? Um, and the people who are, are, you know, like are taking care of them, who are responsible of, uh, for maintaining them and also for those who inhabit these places, right? They, they bring their own stories and their own uh, work into them as well. So I'm sure that must have been an interesting experience as well uh, to interact uh, with, uh, like you said, you know, the people who are now inhabiting uh, what, what was meant to be uh, Sir Gangaram's uh, home. It's a story that's certainly inspiring people where I come from right. as I start to relay what's happening here. And it should be a deep point of pride for the people of Lahore. 
Um, you know, certainly in my own family, there was a narrative of loss that was never challenged, right. uh, you know, and me coming here um, was was in some ways an act of defiance of this this continued narrative that we might have on both sides of a border now, you know, that there was only suffering, there was only violence. Right. We know that there were great acts of kindness, and we know that you know, once upon a time, you know, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, Jains, they lived side by side. Lahore is now a part of my story as the great crossroads that my grandmother, my daddy G always talked about, mm -hmm. the place where civilizations and cultures meet, the place where great trade and exchange happens, the place where religions were born and religions began to interact. And it's truly a crossroads of the globe that I now feel is a second home for me. And I'm prepared to tell that story uh, everywhere I go now. So, um, so tell me, Senator, uh, how do you imagine uh, Sir Gangaram, someone, someone like him, how do you imagine uh, he would have uh, felt about um, the ongoing social as well as uh, the different planetary uh, challenges that we're facing? Um, you know, as we speak, um, you know, Pakistan has uh, suffered huge losses. Um, in the as a result of uh, you know massive flooding both from glacier outbursts and also from um, unexpected and catastrophic monsoon rain, rains um, and bringing it back to the uh, uh, power plant that we talked about and, and how his design was so in tune with and aligned uh, with nature and not, and not going in uh, sort of um, you know diversion uh, with it. So do, do you think uh, renewable energy sources and, and, and planetary responsibility, the climate crisis, do you, do you think these would have been issues close to Sir Gangaram's heart? When people look at Sir Gangaram's legacy, everyone has a different part that speaks the most to them. For mm -hmm. some people, it's the ingenuity, you know, that he could make water run uphill and, and of course not disrupt the flow of a river. For some people, it's the vision that he saw much further than others and was able to challenge conventions of the time, um, maybe not even knowing that history would be on his side, but certainly knowing that something better could exist for people. That legacy is probably strongest in his care for widows. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality for Hindu, Hindu widows 100 years ago was that from a very young age, they could be cast aside or sentenced to death just by uh, by accident of who they married and that person's death. And, um, you know, we are going to visit the Fountain House later today, which was not only a marvel in terms of ho housing widows, mm -hmm. uh, making sure they had a safe place to, to be in community, but we've since learned that he, um, that the, the current operators of Fountain House as a mental health facility uh, are replicating it mm -hmm. in different parts of the world. So he would also love that his solutions from a century ago are replicable. That meant a lot to him that you could scale out. You didn't right. always have to scale up, but you could scale out into different communities. And finally, my favorite part of his legacy was his compassion, uh, you know, was the idea that um, he never stopped feeling for people, especially those most voiceless and marginalized. There's a story that uh, when Haley College approached him and said they needed more space to educate women, mm -hmm. he essentially said, I have nothing left to give. I've given it all away to charity or to my family, right. but I still have my house, so you can have that. Mm -hmm. And most people wait until they've passed on to offer their house, but he moved into a smaller apartment and even offered his own home at the end of his life. So when you put all these pieces of his legacy together, it's very clear that a complex problem like climate change would matter a lot to him, and he would approach it with both practicality and also compassion. And that's the kind of spirit we need right now. It's a, it's a fractioned movement where some people have solutions that are very much based on just the energy production and just what will yield the most uh, carbon offset mm -hmm. or reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But you also need to create solutions that matter to people, right. that they can feel and touch and feel like a, a continuation of their life experience. They want to be able to have access to electricity. That's what made great society possible, and that's what he believed in. But if any of that happens in a way that 
causes harm to people, he would want that to change. And I believe uh, he would be, you know, not only looking for those solutions that most help rural places and people living in poverty in a way that still maintains the environment that we have, but he'd also be trying to make sure that every penny goes to the right people who've already been harmed and who need food in their stomachs before they can start to think about our climate change reality. That's that's actually true and very uh, it's a very poignant uh, observation uh, because again uh, challenges of the planetary scale might come uh, lower on the rung of of uh, concerns for someone who is uh, struggling to you know uh, ensure that the next meal is coming in. Um, it, it, I'm going to paraphrase this quote, but there's a wonderful quote from him that essentially says that. Uh, the independence of the nation hinges on the the hunger of the people. And right now they have empty stomachs. If you have an empty stomach, you can't think as much about your fellow countrymen. You need to feel safe and taken care of first. And then you can think about your society and community. And he really understood that very well. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator, if I may, uh, how much... Does the legacy um, and the work of Sir Ganga Ram uh, influence, if at all, uh, your work uh, in politics and governance uh, and and in uh, the legislature? Uh, how how do you uh, incorporate his values uh, into your work? Well, I think the really beautiful thing is that I've lived a life in some ways modeled after his without knowing the full story. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have a dusty old biography that essentially catalogs his his good works, but right. it's hard to get a feeling and a sense of who he is from that. And yet I woke up every day from a very young age wondering how I can be of service to others, wondering how I can give back, wondering what else I have to give. Um, you know, one thing that I'll only repeat because my husband's not here to say it himself is as we've traveled around, uh, you know, he's said something that means a lot to me and he's told people that I wouldn't say it myself, but I, I came to Vermont, a place where I had no ancestral uh, kin to call my own right. and really made uh, my own path, you know, really came with a suitcase and ended up a beloved state senator, as he describes it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that means a lot to me to, to think about Sir Gangaram and his humble beginnings. You know, he read in the lamplight because he didn't have access to fuel mm -hmm. at home. Uh, he sent half of his stipend in college back to his family and lived off of very meager amount of money to get through engineering school. And so many of my forefathers, I believe, lived somewhat in his shadow, realized that they could never quite achieve the same things that he did. And perhaps it's a value to me that I thought I was forging my own path, that I wasn't always comparing myself to him, right. but that one day I could wake up and learn his story and see myself reflected in it. And do you feel that you have come to that point in life? I don't think anyone can compare, <laughs> uh, you know, their successes to the legacy that Sir Gagaram leaves. And in fact, I've met so many Lahores and Punjabis who strive every day to achieve the greatness of some of the founders and architects of the city of Lahore. And they are probably the only people that uh, can sort of be a standard bearer because everyone is so talented and so accomplished here, so well-rounded even. Everyone has a really interesting facet of their life that's almost hidden, um, that you have to have truly great people, almost saint-like to compare yourself to just so that you can keep getting up every day and putting one foot in front of the other and knowing you can do more and do better. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I, I posed this question is because, um, well, I couldn't help but uh, go through some of the uh, legislature that you've uh, proposed and supported. Um, and I see that you have a lot of focus on uh, uplifting and supporting the healthcare service providers. Um, and then also you have a very strong, uh, uh, you know, like you're, you're a very strong proponent for uh, victims and survivors of domestic violence. 
Um, and as we have this conversation right now, the 16 days of activism uh, are, are, are happening. Uh, so would you like to tell us a bit about uh, what drives you and motivates you uh, to pursue these issues and, and to keep them alive uh, in your work? Sir Ganga Ram and I had two very important principles we shared in common that probably simply run, run through my veins. You know, one is that there are the ways that you change people's lives so that they can actually live, mm -hmm. healthcare, food, you know, a sense of, uh, of well-being. Um, and then there are the things that you do so that people can have a life that's worth living museums, education, arts, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he clearly believed that there was a progression, that you had to start with meeting people's basic needs, but that wasn't where great society stopped. Uh, you had to really truly give people a sense of purpose and dignity um, and pride, in fact. You know, I think it clearly meant a lot to him to be a native son of Lahore, uh, you know, and of Punjab and not to wait for the British to do things for people here. And he wanted to instill that spirit in others. The other principle that he lived by that is, is clearly one that has influenced me without me even knowing his full story is that there, there is nothing worth doing if it leaves people behind or causes people harm. Um, you, it policy can feel great. It can, um, you can feel like you're making a difference, but if it's excluding people, then you haven't quite done your work. I learned uh, from the director of Fountain House yesterday mm -hmm. that there was a story that stayed with Sir Gangaram for his whole life. Um, when you know, and I of course love Amritsar and you know love the wonders of every religion that have uh, have made um, you know have have been a point of pride. Um, but but there's a story that goes that his father, who would be my great 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 grandfather, took him to the Golden Temple of Amritsar, mm -hmm. and uh, there were beggars in front of this incredible shiny Golden Temple. And his father said something to him like, "You know, what is the value of a Golden Temple if people are begging outside?" And that stuck with Sir Gangaram for most of his life. Of course. In the symbolic sense, what that has meant is that modernity shouldn't leave people behind. He didn't, he didn't believe that uh, creating a modern Lahore meant that you could leave out people with disabilities, leave out women and widows, leave out children, especially female children. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that without knowing how deep it runs in my blood, uh, I have lived by. I have absolutely lived by. It's meant um, I have almost always give it, gotten the ire of my colleagues for, for challenging a bill that's good, but not equal. Right. Uh, and so, you know, his, his spirit and knowing this story just this week has been life-changing and, and a watershed moment for me just to know a lot more about where that, that comes from inside of me. That's, that's absolutely wonderful uh, <laughs> insight. Um, and honestly, it takes me a moment to uh, absorb everything that you're sharing with <laughs> us today um, because it is a huge, huge uh, legacy to, to, to carry and to remember. Um, but I feel like uh, you having, you know, like uh, established your own uh, name, your own, and, and sort of bringing your own values uh, into your work and then finding later on uh, how much that uh, sort of coincides with or, or runs parallel uh, with the work that your great-great-grandfather uh, was invested in and, 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 and the results and impacts of that, uh, that work today. Um, and you also, I also wanted to point out uh, and appreciate the um, connection that you made with the, the urban architecture and, and with human development uh, as a whole. Right. I mean, like it's important to address, uh, you know, basic needs, but it's also important to go beyond that and and, and, uh, and not just stop there. Right. So development, uh, not just of infrastructure, but also of, of the human being um, and of the whole person. Right. Um, so so I think those are very, very uh, interesting values and principles that you've highlighted for us today. 
So, Senator, you've been um, in the legislature for about uh, 10 odd years now. Uh, that's, right. that's that's quite a stretch. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and some brilliant, brilliant work that you've been able to uh, achieve during the time as well. Um, but most interesting for me is the fact that you started out at the age of 21, 22, That's while right. you were still a senior uh, in college, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, and you've also had the opportunity to interact with uh, uh, the youth over here in Lahore, uh, speaking at universities and all. Um, what can you share uh, from your experience uh, uh, as, as a young legislator um, and, uh, you know, someone who comes from a, a culturally diverse background, uh, you know, what, what, what message, uh, would you like to give to the young minds out there listening? Yeah. You know, what I would say first and foremost is in my decade or so serving in elected office, this is the moment I've been waiting for. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a millennial now mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. Uh, I could see for years G Gen Z coming and the hunger and passion that they have, the drive for equality. And I felt that my job is to make the way a little bit easier for them to lead and raise my voice a little louder so that, you know, they can turn up the volume as well. And we're seeing that across the globe, young people, uh, Gen Z stepping up to run for Congress, to become mayors, um, to overthrow governments. And so we have to really look at Pakistan and how young of a country it is. I mean, it's really astounding. Um, and the mismatch between the age of the population and the age of those representing this population. That is true. Um, that's true in governments all over the world. You know, United States is, is certainly not immune to that. Um, we have an aging Congress and we have aging state legislatures as well. And they simply have a different life horizon, a different set of experiences that are not serving younger families, younger people well, who are buying their first home, who are trying to find their first job, who are trying to change the culture so that it's more open and equal uh, and flexible, frankly. Mm -hmm. And there are barriers. There are deeper barriers here than I will ever understand, especially for young women. Mm -hmm. But there are barriers everywhere. And it is deeply uncomfortable to break through those and to run for office and to change the culture. But it simply has to happen. Um, and people have to be brave enough and uncomfortable enough to do that. I know that, for example, here, the party system is fairly rigid. It's not like you can stand alone like I did and simply run regardless of having the party infrastructure behind you. Um, but these parties need to change. They need to become more flexible. They need to become younger. And they're not going to do it on their own. Yeah. Young people are going to have to organize and get involved in mass. And in fact, you know, people shouldn't frown at local service, at provincial service. It's where most people get their start. It's where, you know, most people you might look up to in the United States got their start. Mm -hmm. And it's where you really learn what governing should look like. Um, so while we need older generations to make room, we also need younger generations to recognize that it is challenging. There is rigor. You know, it's not just about your best tweet your best clap back to somebody's comment. Mm -hmm. What it's about is building an agenda and serving the people. And it's important to practice that and to learn that at the local level and then keep rising the ranks to higher office. You know, that's what I've done and hope to continue to do. And uh, it's going to take an intergenerational conversation and uh, dialogue to do that. So everyone's going to have to get a little bit uncomfortable, but especially a country like Pakistan where young people have so much to offer. It would be a shame if they only offered that elsewhere and not to their native land. That is a, that is a serious and very, um, you know, a, an observation very rooted in reality, I'd say. Um, Senator, how hopeful are you uh, for the future of, of a younger looking uh, political core, um, and I don't just mean in the U.S. or in Pakistan, uh, but a, a, a political elite that is more egalitarian, that is, uh, you know, less uh, 
age focused or 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 um let's say that 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 values you know like a larger age number uh um in that sense um how hopeful are you uh, for that kind of a reality in the coming decades let's say um and what do you think uh, are the kind of changes that 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 kind of a system uh, might bring yeah i mean I, i'll frame it this way i'm extremely concerned mm -hmm. about the complexity of the challenges we have right. to take on i'm extremely concerned that the stakes are getting higher and higher that the stakes are global conflict and planetary collapse. And so that makes me all the more hopeful that we will find a way to rise above our pettiness and the small differences that we have when the stakes are this high and the need for cooperation and forward thinking is so great. Uh, so, you know, I do believe we can rise above our nature and be better. And often it does take a crisis for us to do that. And we have what we're continuing to consider poly crises, mm -hmm. multiple crises happening at one time from inflation to climate change to famine, uh, you know. And so um, I look at the younger generations and I think they've grown up sadly, but importantly, with a very serious edge, with a deep knowledge that uh, the the magnitude of our problems are great. And I think that uh, the magnitude of our solutions will be greater. So I, I just I just want to bring it back a little bit to um, your experience uh, starting out uh, as a legislator. Um, and how much did it play to your favor or 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 not? Um, you know, uh, being so young and, and, and right in the midst of it. Um, did you have trouble being taken seriously? Uh, and if so, I mean, how did you overcome that? And I, I would like to sort of tie this in uh, with, uh, you know, like how you would advise a, a, a younger, uh, let's say, a, a Gen Zer mm -hmm. uh, on, on, on how to deal with challenges of, uh, of that nature. Yeah, it, there is no uh, perfect solution. There's no perfect balance. But I will say that some of the best advice I received was that if I act like the youngest legislator and I talk about myself as the youngest legislator and I set myself apart generationally, people are going to treat me like the youngest right. legislator. And you actually don't want that. You don't want your colleagues to feel that you carry yourself so differently, that you're not part of the same body doing the same work and getting up every day trying to figure out uh, what's going to move the state forward and the country forward and um, going to bed every night worrying about, you know, whether or not you've done enough. We all share much more in common than our differences. And it's really valuable to learn what people are passionate about rather than stay stuck in your identity. Um, I think it's, I, I, you know, people think of me as someone who celebrates who I am, the barriers I've broken, the barriers I want others to be able to break. But when it comes to serving the people, you are there to represent all voices and all perspectives. And um, there is something that gets everyone up in the morning and keeps them up at night. And it's usually early childhood education or, you know, housing and infrastructure um, or climate change. And so the, we have much more in common when we're there doing the work of the people and taking right. our votes. And that's what we have to remember. Well, thank you so much for that. Senator, are there any uh, closing words or uh, experiences about uh, being in Lahore that you'd like to share with us? Uh, I, I'm looking for, you know, like an interesting <laughs> anecdote maybe uh, from, from, you know, like, uh, well, just your time over here, frankly. Yeah, you know, there there's so many, it's hard to put into words. I mean, I'll tell you for for me and my husband, um, what was kind of the climactic moment in mm -hmm. our in our trip thus far? I still have another day, but I, I think that most of the excitement is over. We went to the National College of the Arts. Right. And, you know, first of all, you can see this great professional love affair between Sir Gangaram and Bairam Singh, uh, you know, who ended up being its first director, um, its first chancellor. And uh, you see the partnership that existed between people of different backgrounds and cultures and religions. And what I think was also important is that 
it didn't matter what pedigree you had. There was a real imposed hierarchy coming from the British that you had to have several degrees and several high positions before you could offer anything to the world. And nothing could be further from the truth when you talked to two great men like that or saw their work. And so I'm experiencing this and, you know, feeling the the depth of Sir Gungram's legacy. And then uh, the vice chancellor at the National College of the Arts and the head of architecture there mm-hmm. started a PowerPoint presentation where they simply put up Sir Gungaram's actual signature. Mm-hmm. Um, and I already was overcome with emotion. Signatures and his, can- his penmanship, probably a signature on a bureaucratic document uh-huh. that he signed so that he could move forward with a particular project. I don't right. think he was particularly flowery mm-hmm. <laughs> in his communication. But I'd never seen his script before. I thought that most of the primary documents of his were lost to time. That was the story that I had in my head. Right. And so you can imagine how delighted they were that they could then lead me into a room that was a complete surprise for me where they had found every single document in the archives that they could around the city. And in fact, they're still finding them now, but uh-huh. they sifted through thousands of documents by hand to find anything that he had communicated, any blueprint with his name on it. And so there I am looking at his original blueprints for homes for nurses to live near the hospital, for schools for girls, for all of his great works and all of the care he put into people being able to have what they need to live well. And I was simply overcome with emotion. And it not it didn't just hit me that it was my own emotion and my own story of loss and being found that so many people in Lahore, on both sides of the border in India, they have these stories of loss in their families. They have these attempts at trying to go back and find some shred of you know their family's history of the place that they were before they were forced to leave. And I'm actually one of the more fortunate ones where an entire city has kept his legacy alive, where I can see so much of who my family was and who he was because of the great love and affection of the people of Lahore. And what a gift, what what a fortunate person I am to have had this experience and to be able to come back to a, a place I can now call home. That's honestly, I'm, I'm, I can't help but get a little uh, emotional from, from, from hearing that. Um, and here's hoping that through this conversation, we're able to bring the legacy of Sir Ganga Ram uh, to even more uh, more people uh, uh, you know, from here on. Um, and um, honestly, it's uh, it's it's been quite uh, revelational for me as well. Uh, that you know, like so so many places that that I've held personal memories uh, associated with the city with. Uh, are now sort of being uh, painted in a new picture uh, and, and are now imbued with this legacy of Sir Ganga Ram and, and all the wonderful work that he's, uh, he's done for the people here. Um, thank you so much once again for uh, making the time to speak with us. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your days in Lahore. Uh, and I hope they're as uh, filled with excitement and uh, reminiscence as, as, as the past couple of days have been for you. Thank you so much for having me. This interview and my entire stay in Lahore has been a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you. I'm very happy to hear that. Thank you so much for tuning into this conversation with State Senator Kesha Ram Hinsdale on her on the legacy of her great great grandfather Sir Ganga Ram. Uh, if you enjoyed this conversation, please leave a like on the video and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Our social medias are in the description, um, and we'll see you in the next one.